All right. Well, it is week four of our series, Rediscover Christmas, Good News and Troubling Times, part four, Finding Love in Our Differences. So this morning, I want to start with a little story, and it's about two farmers. So there were once two old farmers. They were neighbors, but they had a feud that had been running for several years. It was so bad, they hadn't even spoken to each other over those couple years. The whole thing got started over a cat. The cat was astray, but both of the farmers began feeding the cat and claiming it as their own. Well, from that point on, everything went downhill. The two farmers quit talking to each other. The grudge escalated to the point that one of them dug a ditch to reroute a spring and make sure that it divided their properties. So one day a carpenter came to the area and he was looking for work. And so he knocked on the door of one of the farmers and the farmer said, well, if he's going to try to divide us up with that ditch, then I might as well just finish the job. I don't even want to look at him. So he asked the carpenter to build a fence all the way across the property line. A nice, big, tall fence. None of us would ever do anything like that, right? So the carpenter says, okay, I, I can do that, but it's going to take a lot more wood than what you have in your shed. So the farmer, he says, okay, I'll go into town. I'll buy more wood. And so while the farmer went to buy more wood, the carpenter started working with the wood that was in the shed. And that farmer came driving back down the dirt road to his home, but when he looked across the field, he didn't see any fence going up. Instead of the barrier he wanted, he saw that the carpenter had built a bridge across the creek. So he walked over to where the carpenter was working, and there... Across the bridge, his neighbor came walking toward him, the one he hadn't talked to in years, with his hand outstretched and a big sheepish grin on his face. You're a brave man, he said. I didn't think you'd want to hear the sound of my voice ever again. Can you forgive me? The first farmer was surprised. And as he, re as he reached out his hand to shake the other farmer's hand, he found himself saying, Oh, I knew it was your cat. So that story is by the singer-songwriter David Wilcox, and he uses it as an introduction to his song called Fearless Love. The song goes on to weave together another story about a church protest and a person caught up in that protest. That person, within all the things happening, remembers Jesus' teaching to his disciples to love his enemies. And he uses the example of the Roman soldier making the Jewish person carry the cross one mile. And we're going to talk about that a little later this morning. And the chorus of that song says this, Fearless love makes you cross the border. The love that Jesus embodied in our world was indeed a fearless love. Besides simply lacking fear, the love of Jesus defies fear. It overcomes fear. And today, as we continue our journey through Advent, we're focusing on the love that Jesus brought into our world and into our lives. So this morning, as we get into God's Word, would you pray with me one more time? Dear Jesus, I thank you so much for today for your blessings and I just thank you for your love and God I pray in in our absence today and in, in not being able to meet that you would be present here with us in our homes in our cars in our offices wherever we are even though we can't be together we would feel your presence this morning God I pray that you would be with us over the next few minutes as we just get into your love and learn about your love. I pray that you would help me. Help me to say the things that you want me to say. Help us to hear the things that you want us to hear. Help us to learn the things that you want us to learn. And God, I pray that we would be changed and, and we would feel your love this morning. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Amen. So as a quick recap, the word Advent means coming or arrival. And the season of Advent is marked by expectation, by waiting, anticipation, longing. Advent is not just an extension of Christmas. It's really a rediscovery of Christmas, a season that links the past, the present, and the future. Advent offers us an opportunity to share in the ancient longing for the coming Messiah, to celebrate his birth, and also to be alert for his second coming. It looks back in celebration at the hope fulfilled in Jesus' coming, while at the same time looking forward in hopeful and eager anticipation to the coming of Christ's kingdom when he returns here to earth for his people. And during Advent, we actively and we hopefully wait for both of these things. And each week we're focusing on a different attribute of God represented in the coming of Jesus. Hope, peace, joy, and today, love. As we've journeyed through Advent, we've been looking at different people in the Nativity story. We've dug into the experiences of each individual. But today I want to look at the people in the biblical account all together at Christ's birth. Because when we do that, I think we'll see that the birth of Jesus brings together a wide variety of people across many different backgrounds, beliefs, and experiences. So we're going to walk through this story a little bit in order here and look at the characters who were there. So we start with Zechariah and Elizabeth. Zechariah and Elizabeth and Mary and Joseph. Zechariah and Elizabeth were both from a priestly line. The Bible says they were both righteous in God's eyes and they were both careful to obey all of the Lord's commands and regulations. And the Bible also says they were very old. And in contrast, Mary and Joseph were young. Mary most likely being a young teenager. So we have the prophets and the covenants of Israel's past, represented by Zechariah and Elizabeth. And we have the fulfillment of the promise of the Messiah and the new spiritual future that God had in place, represented by Mary and Joseph. And as we saw last week, Mary even goes and visits with Elizabeth because of all the things that are happening and these experiences and, and the birth of Jesus that's about to happen, that she's pregnant with Jesus, she goes and visits Elizabeth. So that brings them together. So the birth of Jesus brings together the young and the old. Then we meet the shepherds and the angels. The shepherds and the angels. The beings of earth, the shepherds, and the beings of heaven, the angels. We have the physical and we have the spiritual. And we also see these two sides coming together as angels meet with Mary and Joseph. And then as they head to the stable, there's animals as well, as well as the humans. We have the beings of creation in the animals. So the birth of Jesus brings together the beings of heaven, of earth, and of creation. And then we can look to Matthew's Christmas account and meet the wise men. Who were these mysterious visitors from the East? You know, we're not entirely sure exactly who they were, but we know they had followed a star a long distance to find and to worship this promised Messiah, Jesus. Some scholars think they may have been from China, uh, but whether they're astrologers or some kind of rulers... We see that the Magi are noble and wealthy men who show us God bridging even more divides. The Magi are the esteemed opposite to our lowly shepherds. Both, or as we look at it, the, the, the Magi are the esteemed opposite to lowly shepherds in the human social structures. But even more importantly, the wise men are Gentiles and not Jews. 
And their inclusion in Jesus' birth story conveys the radical idea that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, brings salvation and restoration to all people, not just the Jews. See, if you're not a Jew, basically you're a Gentile. So this was a big deal. We have the young, we have the old, we have the beings of heaven, of earth, of creation. We have the esteemed, we have the lowly, we have the Jews, we have the Gentiles. And one interesting point to note in all of this, there are no Pharisees, no Sadducees, no spiritual VIPs of the day who were present at Jesus' birth. So the cast of characters that we see at the birth of Jesus that God assembles for the arrival of his son on earth is far from the expectations any of us would have imagined. And probably even further from the expectations of the people of that time who lived and breathed within that culture and its divisions. You know, to us, it may seem like a pretty ragtag bunch, but to the people of the day, it was downright blasphemous that the Messiah would be so lowly and associated with the full spectrum of unclean humanity and creation. Could Jesus have united any more divisions just simply in his birth? Hardly. He pretty much covers all of them. And in doing so, God revealed several things about his love that I want to look at today. So our first point is this. Christ is love embodied. Christ is love embodied. The Bible talks all about love. It tells us that God is love, and the Bible is his love story for all of humanity. We see this from the beginning. In creation, God created people. And shared time with them in the garden as companions. He walked with them. He talked with them. But then sin enters the world. Bringing death. Brokenness. Separation from such a close relationship with God. But he still continued to love his people. God's love never changed. Through generation and generation, he worked his plan and promised a Messiah to make a way to restore relationships with all of humanity. That way is Jesus. It is only through Jesus that our relationship with God can be restored. One of the most famous verses in the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his Son. It's rooted in love. His plan for everything is rooted in love. Even the metaphors that Jesus uses in the Bible speak of his love. You know, Jesus is described as the groom and we, the church, are described as the bride. This relationship with God that he brings us into is a relationship of love. It's a reunion with love itself. And I remember uh, I used to play drums with uh, Chris and Randy and Gary, and we would go out and we would uh, play at different places. And, and I remember a conversation we had one time, and, and Chrissy was telling me about, uh, she was talking to her daughter, and they were talking about the songs, and her daughter Gracie was pretty young at this time. And they were talking about the songs, and and Gracie said to, to Chrissy, Mom, these are like all love songs. And it's like, yeah, that's, that's it. It's all about love. God loves us, and we love him. And John the Apostle gives us a great picture of the love of God in 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 16. So let's read that together this morning. 1 John chapter 4 verses 7 through 16. Dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God 
and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God showed how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. The last verse, verse 16. We know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. Then it says, God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. John tells us that God is love. He personifies it. It's his nature. It's who he is. And he's shown it to us by sending his son, Jesus. When we come to Jesus, giving him our lives, we're restored to love. We're fulfilled in love. We live in him and he lives in us. We can count on God's love. It won't let us down. It never changes. It fills us. It fuels us. It calls us. And most importantly, it enables us to love one another. And that brings me to our second point. Love defines and propels us. Love defines and propels us. We're going to look at chapter 13 of John. But before we do, let me give you an idea of what's happening here. Let me set the stage a little bit. Jesus, we're going to be reading the words of Jesus here, and he's talking to his disciples. He's at the Last Supper toward the end of his life, and they've just eaten together. Um, He has just called out Judas as the one who's going to betray him. And now he's shifted, and he's focused in on his disciples, and he's talking to them about how he's not going to be around much longer. That he'll be leaving them. So then in John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, we read this. Jesus says, So now I am giving you a new commandment. Love each other. Just as I have loved you, you should love each other. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. So as Jesus talks to his disciples, he wants them to make sure that they love like he does, that they see the importance of loving one another. And, you know, usually when we look at some of the last things that people say, we realize those are pretty important things. Jesus is coming to the end, and he's really focusing in on the most important stuff, and, and he talks about love with his disciples. He wants to make sure that in his physical absence, they know what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to live, how they're supposed to love. And he had given them the ultimate example. We read in 1 John 4, 19, we love each other because he loved us first. The disciples were called to love because Jesus had loved them first. We are called to love because Jesus has loved us first. Here's the most important part. How will people know? How would people know that the disciples, the followers, that they were actually followers of Jesus? By the love they showed to each other and other people. And the question then turns to us. How will people know that we are Christians, that we are 
followers of Jesus. It's by our love. It's by our love for others. And that sentiment, that idea is echoed in, in 1 John as we read just a little bit earlier. Love is what defines us. It, it marks us. It characterizes us. It, at least it should. You know, the church in general hasn't always done a great job of this. You know, it's easy for us to point fingers at some pretty big wrongs from the church throughout history. And, you know, we can all probably think of public Christians and churches in our time that might make us cringe a little with embarrassment at their unloving actions. But really, we have to look at ourselves. Look at the things that we can control. Of course, no one is perfect as individuals as individuals or a collective church, but each of us can choose to love, to love like Jesus did, because he commanded us to, and because he set the example for us. And I'm sure in this Christmas season, we can certainly find some opportunities in our current cultural climate to allow God's love to flow through us to other people. So one final point this morning, and it's this. Love empowers us to cross borders. Love empowers us to cross borders. Without a doubt, we are living in divisive times. It seems like throughout our culture, our nation, our world, people have multiplied the ways to divide us. And I believe division is one of the major tactics of the devil. He wants us to be divided. He doesn't want us to be in unity with others. He wants us to be apart and separated and divided from other people. I've really been feeling this and, and sensing this really over the past nine months with all the things that have been going on. It feels like there is a side for everything. And a lot of times we feel like that we have to pick one of those sides. We have to be on one side or the other, mask or no mask. You know, the virus is real or it's made up. Uh, Republican or Democrat, get the vaccine, don't get the vaccine. There's these sides. There's always this us versus them mentality. And it's by no means an excuse, but, you know, throughout history, our world has been filled with wars and plunder and oppression. And we've always had this idea of us versus them. There's always been the weak, the powerful, the haves and the have nots. There's been too much us versus them since the days of Jesus and even further back in history. And sadly, as we look at it, there, there really still is. But that's why Jesus' teaching is so radical. It's so countercultural. It's why it, it's so hard to understand sometimes. In Matthew 5, verse 43 and 44, Jesus says this. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Man. How's that for your us versus them approach? To love our enemies? To pray for them? He basically said, yeah, the people that you disagree with, yeah, you need to love them. You need to pray for them. Jesus didn't only tear down the walls of division at his birth. He continuously reached across the bridge of separation and exclusion. Look at these examples. He befriended hated tax collectors. He even invited one, Matthew, to follow him as one of his 12 disciples. He healed the sick. He touched the diseased. He spoke with the Samaritan woman at the well, which broke a couple rules all at the same time. You know, Jews didn't associate with Samaritans, and Jewish men especially didn't talk to women like that in public. What was the common denominator of all those people? He loved them. That was it. That's why he brought everyone together, because he loves everyone. He loved them all. 
And just a few verses earlier in Matthew 5, in the same vein of loving your enemies, praying for those who hurt you, Jesus says this. If a soldier demands that you carry his gear for a mile, carry it two miles. He told his listeners, Jesus told his listeners, that if a dreaded Roman soldier forced them to carry his pack for a mile, which the soldiers could do and often did, to go ahead and carry it too. What a verse this is, just kind of tucked in here. Jesus was talking about something called this... Uh, idea called impressment. And what that meant was a Roman soldier could make a Jew carry his 100 pound pack 1,000 steps or a Roman mile just because they were a Jew. You know the Jews were under Roman rule and and the the Roman army was huge and and powerful. And the Jews were under that rule and therefore they were seen as second class if a soldier were to ask them to carry that pack it was demoralizing it was demeaning it was degrading it was this idea that the soldier was better than the jew and they knew it and the jew couldn't do anything about it this is actually where we get the phrase to go the extra mile um but what an example Jesus uses to stress the importance of loving our enemies. That if they would ask you to carry that pack, that you should carry it twice as far. And let me just say here that God is calling us to love people. And those people are probably going to be doing things that we may not always agree with. But... God is not calling us to love the things they are doing, the things that they are supporting. We are called to love the person because God loves that person. That doesn't mean that we just agree with everything they do, that we start doing something that we know God wouldn't want us to do. So we have to be careful there that we love the person, but we don't have to begin doing or agree with the things that they're doing. There's a, a separation there. One of the most powerful stories um, that Jesus tells about this unexpected, difficult love in action is the story of the Good Samaritan. You may already know how this story goes, and if not, I'll recap it for you. A traveler was robbed, beaten, and left for dead on the side of a road. A Jewish priest came along and crossed the road to avoid the bloody scene. An assistant Jewish priest came, did the same thing, went around, walked around, got away from him. But finally, a Samaritan came along and saw the man and stopped to help him. The Samaritan bandaged the man's wounds, put him on his donkey, delivered him to an inn. He paid the innkeeper to take care of him. Until the Samaritan could come back and said, hey, if it costs more, just let me know. This is a great and challenging story for us. But in that day, this was an incredibly astounding story. Very difficult to understand. The Jews hated the Samaritans. The Jews' racism against the Samaritans went back centuries when the kingdom of Israel had split. The Samaritans intermarried with foreigners and established their own temple to worship in. The Jews considered them an inferior race with a corrupt religion and viewed them with prejudice, with disdain, with hatred. But this is who Jesus was holding up as an example of love, as an example of our neighbor. Jesus was crossing the divide. He was crossing the bridge. He reached across the cultural, the spiritual, the political, the racial divisions, and he calls us to do the same. He was illustrating this kind of love that John later describes in 1 John chapter 4. It says this, Such love has no fear, because perfect love expels all fear. 
If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he first loved us. The love of Jesus is fearless love. And it calls us, it enables us to cross the borders, to tear down the barriers, to reach out above the disagreements. The fear that is driven out by love is the fear that we have within ourselves. Love, overcome, love overcomes the fear of the other, the other person. The other who may not look like us, sound like us, have the same perspective or experience as us. So as we close this morning, I want to read a passage from the book of Ephesians chapter 3. And really this passage is my prayer for each and every one of you as you're listening today. So let's read it together. It says Ephesians 3 uh, verses 17 through 19. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. And this, this, is, this is my prayer right here. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, and how deep His love is. May you experience the love of Christ, though it's too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. My prayer this morning is that you would understand, that you would, under, that you would experience the incredible love of God. Even though it's too great to fully understand, I pray that God would show it to you. He would reveal it to you, that you would feel the amazing love of God. Because God does love you more than you think, more than you know. More than you can imagine. God loves you. But my prayer doesn't stop there. It's just the first part. As you begin to experience this love. As you begin to understand this love that God has for you. As you rediscover that love this Christmas in this season. Let's share it with other people. Let's reach across the bridge because of the love of God and with the love of God. Maybe for you, reaching across the divide begins with your family. Maybe it's your in your home, in your neighborhood, in your workplace, in your community, at your school. Jesus at Christmas and really all the, at all times calls us together into his loving presence and invites us to make room for everyone. Whether, they, whether we think they deserve it or not. There's humility in love. A willingness to put someone else first. Sometimes love means taking the simple step of building that bridge as a gesture, as an invitation. You know, just like our, our story of the farmers in the beginning. Sometimes it's, it's being willing to listen and not to defend it's always being willing to choose to see someone else not as an other, but as us, equally loved by God. Equally welcomed into his presence, equally drawn into and propelled out of his miraculous, divine, all-consuming love. This is God's love. This is the gift of Christmas. This is the heart of Christmas. God's love. God's amazing love. So as we rapidly approach Christmas Day and the expectation and the excitement increases, I invite and challenge us all to rediscover Christmas by rediscovering the overwhelming, all-encompassing, all-welcoming love of God. Would you pray with me this morning? Dear Jesus, I thank you so much for your word this morning. 
that you would speak to us. I thank you for your love, God. Your all-powerful, all-consuming, undeserved, incredible love. I thank you for that this morning, God. I pray that each and every person listening and engaging today would feel that, would feel that love that you have for them, that they would experience it in a real and a powerful and a mighty way. As Ephesians said, that they would have the power to understand how wide, how long, how high, how deep your love is for us. And, and as we experience it and as it fills our lives, help us to take that love and to share it with other people. That we wouldn't just keep it to ourselves, but that we would share it with others. Because you love other people. And we are called to love other people. We love because you first loved us. So we thank you for that love. I pray that this Christmas season and moving forward in our divisive culture, that you would help us to reach out, reach across the bridge, and to love. We know that it's only through you we can do this, and so we ask for your help. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for watching and engaging and, and being a part online this morning. You know, I wish we could have been together, but we're thankful for this technology uh, that we could still uh, share God's Word and, and be in it together. So thank you so much for, for tuning in and... Um, love this Christmas season. As, as we're getting closer, man, I hope you experience God's love. I pray he pours his love down on you and on your family. And I pray that as he does that, that you would share that love with other people. Thanks so much. Don't forget our Christmas Eve service on Thursday at 7 p.m. Carols, candles, and communion. We'll see you. Have a great day.